everyone and uh, welcome to this very very uh, interesting session and uh, uh, power packed uh, panel there to speak on uh, making finance work for women entrepreneurs policy perspectives and recommendation for financial institutions i welcome all the panelists today and uh, we have uh, today on our panel uh, uh, shri sanjeev kaushik additional secretary department of uh, financial services uh mr kaushik is with the ministry of finance currently as additional secretary and prior to this he was principal secretary finance of uh, kerala where he also uh, where he is also concurrently serving as a full time chairman and md of kerala finance corporation and deputy ceo of kerala infrastructure investment fund in 2018 sanjeev uh, kaushik was appointed whole time member of sebi Mr Kaushik has a rich stint of 12 years in global investment banking as managing director of equities at at uh, HSBC and as MD of Lehman Brothers in Mumbai. Uh, Mr Kaushik has done his MBA from London Business School and mechanical engineering from Bets Pilani. Welcome Mr Kaushik. I would also like to welcome uh, the moderator for the this panel session uh, very well known uh, amongst us uh ms girija shri nivasan uh girija ji has been a development banker for more than a decade and now into successful international consulting practice in india and overseas her areas of interest are rural livelihoods rural banking financial inclusion and community based organization of women and for and farmers she also has authored several reports individually uh, jointly these include books as well studies especially on sg bank linkage programs um, as an international expert she serves as a consultant and advisor to international fund for agriculture development giz nabard microsave micro my, uh, frankfurt school i can go on and on and so i heartily welcome uh, girija shrinivasan as a moderator for this panel also on this panel is a very well known to us dr smita premchandar uh, she is the lead researcher for the study that is uh, that will be presented uh, today during the session and um, we know that she is a development consultant with over 36 years of experience she is a practitioner researcher teacher and advisor on issues ranging from uh, microfinance poverty reduction social inclusion child labor gender equality and women empowerment uh, and also food security um, she has an uh, internationally diverse uh, work experience has worked with agencies such as ilo brac world bank nddb and care india uh, welcome uh, smita ji uh, to this session my with great pleasure i also welcome greta bull uh, good morning greta uh, welcome to this uh, you know very interesting uh, discussion that we are all looking forward to greta is the director of women's economic empowerment at the bill and melinda gates foundation prior to gates foundation greta served as cgap ceo through july 2021 she has 20 years of experience in development finance primarily focused on small and medium enterprises Uh, microfinance and digital financial services she has worked in several continents uh, as uh, with financial service providers as well as policy makers in uh, latin america central and eastern europe sub saharan africa and of course south asia greta has a master's degree in public policy from harvard university the jfk school and an undergraduate degree in international studies from the university of washington uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you greta Also on the on panel is Ms. Mena Safavian. Uh, Mena is the lead financial specialist with the World Bank, and uh, uh, she is uh, she has worked with the World Bank Group in multiple regions and covers MSME finance, infrastructure finance, creditors' rights, and financial uh, uh, inclusion. Uh, prior to her tenure with the World Bank, she worked for the U.S. government, uh, academia, and in the non-profit sector as well. Menas holds a master's and PhD in economics and continues to publish in World Bank publications and academic journals. So I welcome all of you. I also welcome all the audience from India and overseas who have joined in for this session. We look forward to a very very exciting session and discussion. Over to you, Girija ji. Before that, uh, uh, I would also like to say that 
the study that uh, you know uh, is uh, is being presented uh, during this uh, uh, session we are going to virtually release the executive summary of the session and uh, the you know the key the main report will be sh will follow shortly so i request uh, the virtual release of the executive summary of this uh, of the study do i declare it released <laughs> yeah please go ahead uh, meena yeah so we we do declare it released and uh, you know over to you giriraj ji wishing a wonderful discussion ahead thank you very much thank you minal and uh, uh, welcome uh, the esteemed panelists welcome audience i think what we are missing only is you know the face to face interaction with the audience we hope that you uh, share your thoughts and also your queries with us don't wait till the end please uh, keep sharing and we will be able to see them and uh, take up your queries um this is uh, as meenal mentioned a very important uh, session uh, because this is uh, the topic is something you know very very close to our um, heart and very important for the development of the country Uh, micro enterprises are the largest employment generators in the country women entrepreneurship in particular is very critical for india because it catalyzes women's participation in the labor force especially at a time when india's female labor force participation rate is at a historic low india ranks 136th among 144 countries in this metric globally women's contribution to gdp is at 37% while in india it is less than 20% women's enterprises matter to the country now more than ever when the employment and job demand is expected to peak this decade the gender gap in the is very stark in the enterprise space women run enterprises have a low share in the total enterprises in the country as government surveys and other studies show the best estimate is 20% of the enterprises are owned by women studies show that the major hurdle in setting up and also scaling up is access to finance though india has a robust financial landscape with a number of public sector banks private sector banks cooperative banks non bank finance companies small finance banks fintech players they are lending to enterprises the small finance banks and the mudra bank were set up to encourage more credit to the enterprises however more than 20, 85% of the debt to women enterprises is from informal sources money lenders chit funds etc the estimates show that there is an unmet demand of 185 billion us dollar of credit for the 150 million women enterprises formal financial institutions definitely seem to have some constraints in lending to women enterprises women's enterprises usually are in the lower spectrum of micro enterprises going by the metrics of capital invested and also sales turnover they are usually unregistered operating as informal enterprises there are apprehensions that the recent change of definition of micro enterprises and also mandatory registration in government portals to be eligible for priority sector lending has a trade off in terms of financial institutions lending to larger enterprises crowding out the smaller sole proprietorships where women largely are operating but currently thanks to the micro finance movement women have access to credit about 122 million women are part of self help groups which is largely rural focused although it may vary with regions and locations it is estimated that about 20% of the sg members have the potential to grow as true entrepreneurs however for a program which is 3 decades old it is not a matter of pride that most of the women entrepreneurs have still not been able to access larger loans which they deserve what stops the financial institutions to finance these women entrepreneurs adequately and with appropriate products 
when they have proven credit history of taking loans through the SLGs. The other part of microfinance sector is the MFI model, which reaches 70 million women through joint liability groups in both rural and urban areas. Many women nano enterprises access loans from MFIs. However, this is a high interest rate mutual guarantee model with transaction efficiency coming from group lending and standardization. These institutions need to graduate their borrowers to larger ticket size, lower interest rate individual loans without the intermediation of the group. World Bank has commissioned a study on how can we make formal finance flow to women enterprises. The study has been carried out by Access Assist. Let us hear from Dr. Smitha Premchanda, the results of the study. We will then have panel discussions on study findings and also on global best practices and learnings from other programs that has worked well. Over to you, Dr. Smitha. Thank you, Girija. Thanks very much for inviting me and also thanks to the World Bank and Access for having our team conduct this study. It was indeed a very intense and a very, very interesting experience to actually learn from supply side challenges because, you know, there are a lot of studies which give you the women's perspective, but there are not that many that you know, investigate what are the problems that the financial institutions face. So from that point of view, it was really, really interesting to uh, do the study. And we had a very large team doing the study. I would like to take you to some of the first things that Girija started with. What is the need for, for um, you know, giving more loans to women. Actually, women's contribution to GDP, as Girija already told you, globally, it's 37%. But for India, it's only 18%. That's not only because of the labor force, but also women's self self-employment and enterprise doesn't get as much finance as it needs to get. And uh, also in the global gender gap report, India used to be 110 ranked. Uh, and now it's ranked 151 across, you know, in the ranking of countries. So basically, poor access to finance is really the one very strongly responsible for constraints uh, of economic participation of women. That said, we also have to remember, and many institutions told us, if there are not enough women's businesses, how do we go and finance them? So finance is an industry that, you know, that follows the real manufacturing and services industry. So in the MSME sector, 30% of India's GDP is in the MSME sector now. And all majority of these uh, enterprises are owned by men, both in urban and rural areas. And if we see the proportion of women-owned enterprises, as the sizes go up, uh, the proportion of enterprises owned by women, go, they go down. So they are 20% in the micro sector, as uh, Girija was saying. But now when you move to the small size enterprises, they go to 5%. And when you go to medium sector, then actually women own only 3% of the total enterprises. So the gap between demand and supply is also about 116 million, as the IFC report shows us. So I'll bring you then into the into what we did in the study. And the first thing we did was a lot of literature review, studied a lot of literature, and there were certain themes emerging. And then we also spoke to women entrepreneurs in FGDs, and we spoke to several institutions. But we started first with speaking to women entrepreneurs themselves. And from there also ratified that these study themes are actually relevant. The first one which came across very strongly is that uh, you know gender disaggregated data on loans from fun formal financial institutions is very, very difficult to get because many of them, they just don't keep it or they don't analyze it. I'm sure it must be there somewhere, but it's not available in public domain. Outreach and awareness was a major issue. How about institutional policies and staff attitudes? These came across very important as very important issues. Appraisal processes, uh, product development and delivery, 
to women's enterprise and then non financial services and linkages was a very very big area of work as well and support from government schemes so we did speak to eight cat 10 categories of financial institutions but they also included networks and they also included development financial institutions so we spoke to 28 institutions and we conducted six uh, focus group discussions with women what we found is that we could by and large do a spectrum across which we could see that there are some institutions which are completely gender agnostic so they are giving enterprise loans but they do not consider women as any important category to separate and think about then there were organizations which were doing some amount of gender sensitive lending and then there were organizations on the other end of the spectrum where we could say the policies and practices and And products and systems were actually looking at thinking about talking to and dealing uh, separately with women's needs and offering them completely tailored products so on gender segregated data we found that there were organizations which had no recognition of different needs of women were not collecting any data there were some which had recognition and partial attention to some needs of women and then there were organizations which were really analyzing looking at collecting the data and tailoring their offerings uh, systematically so essentially unless we conduct unless we collect gender disaggregated data it becomes very difficult to identify existing gender disparities and formulate policies for financial inclusion so this is really important for policy as well as better design products and services to actually address the gaps in data collection on outreach and communication again on the same spectrum we found organizations which are again completely agnostic they do not see the need for having outreach strategies which will uh, cater to the needs of women and see whether you know they're reaching enough women or not and on the other hand we did have organizations that were looking at when do women come so we had good practices uh shared by people by organizations saying that they you know locate branches in places where women can come easily they, they calibrate the timing so that women can come out of their housework and other in, you know times when they can reach and not a 9 to 5 sort of branch opening and information campaigns using channels like radios that reach women very easily and also doing gender differentiated clients needs assessments and then also important was the fact that you know women cannot be clubbed into one category because there are women also have differentiated needs across geographies across classes across social segments and so there were organizations which were conscious of this and uh, you know tailoring their outreach and communication strategies accordingly so and then this this spectrum was really working for us in terms of analyzing again in terms of institutional policies we found that there were organizations which had no policy nothing no no statement about reach to the outreach to women entrepreneurs and finances to women and were not more, their staff attitudes were similar on the other hand we had institutions of course which were completely uh loaning to women and then in the middle were several organizations for example organizations which had moved let's say from nbfcs to becoming small finance banks now i cannot we we should not typecast this because in a small study like this it's very very important not to generalize but there were organizations which came from dealing completely with women into becoming small finance banks let's say so they male clients as well but were completely conscious and very careful about the needs of the women clients as well so 
I think it was very came out as very important that gender sensitization across all the staff levels at the institution is important. Uh, greater participation of women in the decision making is important. And actually, what is really, really important is if an institution actually commits to increasing loans to women's enterprises, because when they are not looking at this. And sometimes they also told us that we give loans to women's enterprises to the extent to which it is mandated by the government. Beyond that, we are not looking at this metric at all. So I, you know, so this highlighted the importance of institutional policies. When it came to risk assessment and appraisal processes, again, there were very good examples because in terms of risk assessment, it becomes very difficult because uh, in the SHG format, SHG bank linkage, the data that is available is group wise and that doesn't provide the information when the group member has to then progress to individual loans. It's easier in the GLG model, but in the SAG bank linkage, it wasn't, it isn't there. So cash flow data then was being used in the absence of collateral and credit history. These were some very good examples, but also came the demand that group transaction data must be provided in through credit bureaus and so to establish credit worthiness. So, and then we found in product development and delivery again, there were organizations which had, which had no attention to gender while designing products. And then there were organizations which were only dealing with women. So they had a very, very good understanding of what kind of products women need. And they had tailored products like cash flow based repayments. There was a lot of adoption of technology, whether that was in collection of repayments or that was in cash flow analysis, or that was in uh, yeah several, several other ways in which, for instance, risk appraisal or credit appraisal or KYC were also done, um, you know, on the basis of uh, technology and long distance and so on. So then the other one which appears very strong is non-financial services, whether it's financial literacy, skill training, business management, uh, digital marketing, lots of services were being provided. But I have to say that not all these were provided by financial institutions. It was very important that uh, NGOs were there. There were some World Bank projects, there are some projects with EFAD, and these are multi sector partnership, multi stakeholder partnerships through the government and uh, through uh, NGOs and so on. And these were predominantly important in building lessons towards how to provide non financial services so that more and more women can get business loans. So I think that's pretty much the study from the financial institutions point of view. And uh, there were a lot of government programs. So there were more than 20 direct financing schemes. There are several refinancing and even guarantee schemes and non-financial support schemes, which are there. What we did find is that primarily the prime public sector banks go to these more often than private sector banks and uh, or, or private sector institutions, even if they are not banks. For financial institutions, accessing government schemes is very time consuming and cumbersome. And we heard from them very strongly that actually they do not lack funds. Uh, they do not lack funds. It's... Uh, yeah, just give me Can half you a minute. in two minutes? Yeah. Yes, in two minutes. Yeah. And, and lack of gender segregated data makes it difficult to analyze and reach the impact of schemes. So basically, I think I've told you the major recommendations. We need a holistic business ecosystem. We need pathways for graduation of women entrepreneurs to the MSME sector. There, there is a huge block. We need gender segregated data and maybe we actually need a lot of women focused formal financial institutions because they appear on the right side of the spectrum. So thank you very much. I'll stop here and Girija over to you. And whenever there are questions, that would be great. So much, uh, Dr. Smita. I think <laughs> in, a, in a short this thing, but you have really brought out, you know, the uh, critical uh, position 
um, of uh, where the financial institutions are now and also you know uh, the good things which are uh, happening and also what could be uh, you know the game changers if uh, women need to be financed uh, adequately thank you very much uh, now i turn to uh, sanjeev ji uh, for your opening remarks uh, sanjeev ji on what is working well and what do you think are the still persisting gaps in women enterprise financing after listening to dr smita thank you uh, gidija ji and uh, what a wonderful panel to be associated with thank you for having me on this uh, discussion um uh, there's a wonderful and eye opening study i must say dr smita and uh, though i don't necessarily agree with all the points in there but let me to set things in the right perspective i think i must take you back to the journey that has begun in the whole area of financial inclusion in india in 2014 if you look at the world bank's findex report that was released in 2013 india had only a 35% coverage of its adult population with bank accounts but in 2014 uh, our honorable prime minister actually launched the jandhan yojana program that was the basic uh, accounts for unbanked adults and today we have come to a stage where in uh, you know we have more than 43 crore jandhan accounts so we made huge strides which has even been recognized by the world bank which in 2018 released the next edition of the findex report in which our number was from 35% we more than doubled it to uh, exceed uh, 75% um so we made huge strides in financial inclusion apart from the jandhan account for uh, providing coverage access to uh, not just uh, men but also to women to all our unbanked population to uh, basic financial services we also launched the mudra yojana program um, uh, in 2015 and then we also have the whole jam trinity that is using your jandhan accounts and the aadhar identity and using mobile banking anyone across the country even in the rural and remote areas could access some of these financial services now all of this is very important because you know india is actually i'm actually leading the uh, ministry's efforts on financial inclusion and we are very proud of what we've done now social inequalities gender disparities have for historical reasons have existed and i'm not going to deny that there are gaps but we are making all our efforts to close some of these gaps in fact women and the inclusion of women account holders women for financial services is the cornerstone of all our policies in financial services to give you just one example uh, the stand up india program was launched in um, 2016 now the stand up india program the whole objective was that each and every public sector bank across the country each branch of that bank should necessarily give a loan to at least one woman beneficiary and one scst that is scheduled caste beneficiaries now i know that uh, uh, this program which runs for a number of years is far from achieving some of the targets that were set out but still 1 lakh loans have been given to women beneficiaries under this program since 2016 and that's an amount of almost 25000 crore rupees so we are we are not yet there but we have come a very long way and through in fact if you look at the mudra yojana which is a small business ticket size loans more than 69% of the loans that are borrowed are by women um, un, uh, entrepreneurs which is a very very significant achievement so i think these two pieces of evidence from mudra take up and from the stand up india program tell us that you know we are fast closing the gaps now just to give you the most recent example of last year when the pandemic hit us and we had a lockdown government was faced with the challenging task of reaching out emergency cash to uh, households across the country to facilitate the exp- household expenses to be met and you know whom what we chose to do we actually chose to transfer the direct benefits the cash into the accounts of women holders of jandhan accounts and more than 20 crore women jandhan account holders received almost 31000 crore 
rupees in that period of three months from April to June of 2020. And that just goes to show that, you know, how important, how focal it is, the role of women, not just uh, women account holders, but also women entrepreneurs in all of what we do as far as policy making is concerned. I think I will just close my initial remarks uh, by saying that, yes, there are gaps, but we are fast closing the gaps and women remain the cornerstone of policy making as far as the Ministry of Finance and Government of India is concerned. Thank you very much, Sanjeev ji. I think uh, the financial inclusion space, what uh, India has achieved, I think the uh, world is looking at us, especially the strides which we made in uh, opening uh, individual uh, savings bank account in the name of the women, and also the aspect which you brought out during the Corona COVID times, how uh, billions of dollars were uh, transferred um, uh, to the women's account, um, uh, utilizing this uh, huge architecture which uh, the uh, Ministry of Finance has uh, set up, it is uh, really lot worthy. But the only aspect which uh, we want to highlight is somewhere financial inclusion is not automatically translating into adequate finance for the women's enterprises. There could be a number of reasons for that. And uh, this session, uh, we would uh, like to explore some of the constraints which the financial institutions face and what exactly do we do so that, you know, that if uh, only 20% of the enterprises are women owned now, in the next decade, can we look at 40%? Can we achieve that many numbers, you know, double the women owned enterprises? So that is the question before the uh, panel, but uh, thank you very much for your, um, you know, highlighting what uh, India has achieved in the financial inclusion space. Now I turn to Greta. Uh, Greta, you have listened to uh, Dr. Smitha and you have such vast experience in several parts of the globe. So what do you think is working well? And where do you think there are persistent gaps in financing the women enterprises. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, so yeah, I, I'm gonna um, maybe bring a global perspective to this and then narrow it down a little bit to India. Um, you will all have much deeper knowledge of India than I do. Um, so, you know, the question that was put to me was, you know, what's the state of, of financing around, of women around the world? And, and frankly, <laughs> I think it's not great. Um, and that's not least because there's so much that we don't actually know. Um, we know at a high level that men and women have pretty unequal access to credit um, and that there is quite significant demand for credit among women-led enterprises that's not being met. Um, we also know that women's enterprises have been hit harder by the pandemic than men's enterprises. There's a pretty good evidence base for that. But these are pretty broad brushstroke figures uh, that are good for mobilizing people around a broad direction of travel, but pretty hard to take more nuanced action against in individual country contexts without knowing a lot more. We don't know who these women are or what their enterprises really need, as was pointed out before. And, and I'd like to touch on something that Smita talked about in her presentation. It's partly because we still talk about women like they're one giant segment. Half of the world's population is not a segment. A woman who runs a medium-sized formal enterprise in Johannesburg or Cape Town is totally different from a rural woman running a side, small shop as a side hustle to farming in Bihar. So we have to get a lot smarter about being clear about what we mean when we talk about supporting women's enterprise. And we need to provide more nuanced solutions for those different segments. Um, because ge those gender gaps are actually being driven by a plethora of factors. Some of them are common um, across different segments and incredibly tangible. For example, in some markets, women unbelievably still can't own accounts or pledge land as collateral without their husband's approval. But then, you know, more broad um, and less tangible, but still quite insidious um, social norms that mean in some countries that women actually can't do something as simple as traveling outside of the home unaccompanied. Um, and, and let's just all remember too that this so-called sort of 
developed world is not exactly miles ahead in this regard, right? So in my own country, the United States, it was only 1974 that a woman in the US was able to get a credit card in her own name. And in 1978, was it possible, or well, was it maybe illegal for a company to fire a woman for being pregnant, which mind bogglingly was pretty fairly common practice at the time. And that's, that's within my lifetime. So th these are not new challenges, right? So what are the things that I think will help to change this equation? Um, actually, first of all, and this seems sort of obvious, but I think it's worth stating, um, we need to make sure that all women are able to earn and control an income. There is absolutely nothing more important a better job on financing um, women's enterprises. I think there are a few really important levers that we can pull and I would put them into sort of three buckets. One is smart public policy. So public policy shapes the environment in which providers operate and helps shape the incentives. An enabling and well-structured regulatory framework is common in many markets where mar microfinance thrives. We at the Gates Foundation are about to embark on some work on this, but you know you can see a thread running through countries that have robust uh, microfinance segments almost always have a pretty good regulatory framework and a good regulator. Um, smart wholesale funding that recognizes that both high borrowing costs and excessive forex risk. Not so much a problem in India, massive problem in Africa. And then regulatory incentives that enable a focus on lower income segments without taking on heavy regulatory burden. And again, you know, Regu regulatory structure matters a lot in that in that context. Um, as has also been stated, good shared market infrastructure is a really important factor. The ability to make and track payments, visibility into credit systems, cash in, cash out infrastructure is also very important for women. Um, and so to be honest, I think India is getting quite a lot of this right, but I think there is also still a lot, a lot more to do. Um, and, and, you know, this kind of speaks to the challenge of data because I have completely different numbers that were shared earlier. But, um, you know, I think undi undeniably, I won't, I won't go into the numbers, um, but the uh, self-help group, large numbers of women, the number I have is 80 million low-income women um, who've gained access to affordable credit on very affordable terms, I would add, which quite frankly, micro enterprises in Africa can only dream of. But that doesn't necessarily provide the kinds of resources that more structured micro enterprises need for working capital or building assets. So we need to think about how we connect the dots with more formal lending mechanisms that sit in MFIs and NBFCs. And that opportunity is pretty considerable. Again, an, an estimate that I saw from the Ministry of MSMEs found that outside of the self-help group movement, they, they estimate there are probably there are approximately 63 million MSMEs in India and that women manage 8 million of them. And in an estimate I saw from the ISC, these enterprises have unmet demand for credit representing 9 billion. Um, you know, the numbers are big no matter how you look at them. Um, the good news is I think the pieces are coming together in India in a really interesting way to continue to build out a more inclusive financial services ecosystem that meets the needs across the spectrum from low-income women in this medium-sized enterprises. And so it's a pretty exciting time to be in the microcredit space right now, but it's also not without risk. So as you grow this ecosystem, careful consideration of the policy environment will be pretty crucially important um, at this stage. Two more quick points. Um, to have smart public policy or indeed better private sector decisioning, you need data. Data is the big lever for the future of finance. And we're only just beginning to scratch the surface of the power of what data can do. Having sex disaggregated data is important at the country level for making better public policy, at the enterprise level for facilitating more effective delivery of credit, and at the individual level for empowering customers with their own credit histories. Luckily, India is very much at the forefront of this new wave of data-driven decision-making. And we'll, I think have time to talk about that a little bit more later. But bottom line, if you can't see a problem, it's very hard to know how to solve for it. And then my last point is investing in specialized institutions. I think it is really hard for a bank to think about serving low-income populations. A bank just has so many better ways to make money as was amply demonstrated in the um, presentation earlier. Serving the mass market looks expensive and risky when you have all of those other options available. In most African countries, the business model is lending to the government, frankly. So why would you bother with the hard work of reaching 
small enterprises. So I think there's immense value in having specialized institutions that serve different segments of the market. And we need non-bank financial institution models that allow providers to come in with lower regulatory burdens so they can build the kind of scale that enables them to eventually start taking deposits and taking on the heavier regulatory burden that comes with that. And by getting liquidity into the hands of these providers, as India does through its priority sector lending mandate, it means they have real money to work with and can at least in theory get to scale. Um, there are many cases of lending NGOs turning into NBFIs and eventually transforming into banks. It's a very common pathway in Latin America and it's emerging as a pathway in India too. We know that it works and it's really about creating a regulatory pathway that allows you to do this and having a regulator who's able to keep a careful eye on what's happening in the sector to make sure it's developing in a healthy way. Again, I think India has been pretty thoughtful on this, but there are good lessons from other places around the world. It's not perfect, but definitely doing well against another of those objectives. So I will stop there because I think we'll get into some of these other topics in more detail later in the session. Thanks. Thank you, Greta. Thank you very much for bringing this uh, global perspectives and also, you know, highlighting some two, three very critical points on uh, uh, we need uh, to really understand the different uh, needs of different segments of women. The data part is uh, very, very crucial. And also we need uh, specialized institutions. I'll have follow on questions to you um, uh, later on this. Um, thank you. Uh, Menas, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. And just first of all, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to join this panel. I, 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 I know and have met all the panel members um, and, and I know how much passion and, and thought has gone into to this particular topic. So it's really an honor to be here. Um, it's also the hardest slot to give me the last slot after all of the other panel members have gone. So I had a, a set of talking points and of course they've already been mentioned by everybody. I thought they were, um, they were really bright and illustrative, but uh, they've already been taken up. So I, I want to kind of give a little reflection to a few points that maybe were said that I'd like to emphasize a little bit more um, or maybe weren't said. And, and just maybe to stipulate, first of all, um, I, I think the overview that Sanjeev gave on the government of India is, is really spot on. And watching the evolution of financial inclusion as I've been doing for many, many years, I've worked on India for quite a long time and left and come back. Um, it's really been a revolution and we look at it as a revolution in India. Um, and we try and take those lessons other places and, and the frontier that India is pushing continues to be pushed. So that's so exciting to be part of that journey um, and, and to take those lessons to other jurisdictions. So I just kind of wanted to start on that. Um, and having said that, and, and the progress that we've seen, obviously there are some pretty stark numbers that were just mentioned in the report, um, which we're proud of the findings of the report, but we commissioned that report specifically because we can't get our heads around the fact that there are only 20% of businesses in India that are, are run by women. This is, this is not acceptable. And it's, it's, it's also not understandable. And so that's part of the reason why we actually, you know, became in, in discussions with access to try and drill down and, and get our heads around why this is happening. And the second point that I think was really interesting coming out of the study was we say 20%, but that's 20% of micro enterprises. You go to the small or the medium category, the number drops even more dramatically. So I would almost put it next to zero. I mean, these are probably exceptions. And as we know from other countries, a lot of times if a woman is on the title, that doesn't mean the woman really owns the enterprise or is running it. Um, so likely these, these are bigger numbers. And maybe the third point I'd like to make is, um, you know, over the past few years in India, we've been looking at this issue. It is impossible to get the data. So if you go to public sector, private sector, it doesn't matter. The data does not exist and we have tried looking for it. So this is, this is just, I know we're gonna hear it over and over again, what you can't measure, you can't reform. There's no business case to be made because we don't have data. So we can't even make the business case. We don't actually know who we're reaching. I mean, the gap in our knowledge is also very striking and also, in my opinion, not acceptable. We need to do better here. So thinking about um, trying to be a little bit more solution oriented and again, acknowledging how far India is. And, and I guess we, we just wanna push the envelope a little bit. 
I would say that there are maybe five points that come to mind when I, I think about trying to crack this, this problem. The first one is data. And so that's been discussed at length. I'm gonna keep bringing it up just so people don't forget. And I say it all the time because I think uh, repetition eventually will, will sneak in. Um, the second is technology. Why are we still doing collateral-based lending in, in certain institutions? Why do assets and someone's ownership of assets replace good underwriting? It doesn't have to be that way. And we know how to do it differently. Technology is the solution. And if financial institutions are using that technology, they're, they're giving away profits, they're giving away money, they're losing revenue. Um, those who are using technology, which includes um, banks, but the fintechs are doing amazing things and really reaching into certain segments of the population that haven't been reached before. So we can, you know, I could name institutions across India that are at the cutting edge, not only of women, but like women in specific sectors, women of specific loan sizes. So, so to me, technology is the second answer. The third one is scale. And scale is really hard to crack. So many of these institutions that we're looking at and many of the financial project products are in early stages. And I don't think they've hit the numbers that we would like to see. And so right now, the, the majority of loans are kind of still in that traditional collateral-based normal underwriting. The innovators are there. They're doing work. Um, how do we grow them? How do we grow the MBFCs? How do we grow the fintechs? How do we get them to the scale that we'd like to see? And, and we have some ideas on that. The fourth point I'd like to make is the pipeline. Every time we talk to a financial institution and our colleagues over at IFC are very, very interested in supporting institutions that reach out to women. And invariably they come back to us and they say the pipeline in India is so thin. How do we build the pipeline? And I think that's really the missing half of the, the finance story is the entrepreneurship story. And again, I have some views on that that I can, that I can talk through later. And, and the last point I'll make is we need to look closely at the institutions. And I've learned a lot from looking at different institutions around the world. And you, know, you don't really see governance well represented in the banking sector. I don't, I don't know how many uh, women are on financial institutions boards. Actually, we should commission that study, but I do know when I look, I don't see a whole lot of women. And I don't see people of color or who look like me or who look like some of the other panelists. They, they just, there's just not enough diversity. Um, then you start looking at senior management and you say the same thing. And then you start going down to the loan officer level and you still see the same thing. Until the institution, until the brains of the institution, the structure of the institution starts looking like women, then they're probably not gonna think women are a priority. I don't think there's a public policy answer to that necessarily, but there is a kind of a social cohesion answer to that. So I would also like to leave the panel with those thoughts for the, for the opening remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Menas. I think wonderful points and, uh, you know, particularly on data, on, you know, uh, it is a little sad to hear that, you know, the, your IFC colleagues is not able to build a pipeline, though there are a um, number of institutions uh, in the financial landscape. Uh, let's uh, uh, talk about this um, when we come to the next to uh, this thing. But more importantly, I think the point which you raised about women being there in the governance, in the management, in the uh, frontline uh, staff, unless uh, these are well represented by women, we cannot expect uh, much uh, financial services for the women. Thank you very much. Uh, now I turn to uh, uh, Sanjeev. Um, Sanjeev Ji, there are a couple of questions from the audience. So I thought I would uh, break it in now. Um, one is, you know, uh, it is uh, somewhat interlinked about the government uh, policy. Um, one is, you know, uh, whether the women entrepreneurship uh, schemes, there is uh, interest uh, subvention uh, getting uh, provided by the government. Will it lead to better access to finance for women or would this lead to diluting the credit discipline? So this is one question and also a kind of related question on credit discipline is because 
the SSG lending program now has uh, a lot of uh, uh, credit uh, uh, interest subvention and also high delinquency rates in several pockets. Is that the reason why the banks are hesitant to graduate the women from SSG led model to the MSME lending? Over to you, Sanjeevji. Thank you, uh, Girijaji. But uh, with your permission, before I actually answer those uh, questions or sub questions, this issue of data availability, uh, I would actually like to say that, uh, you know, in all our schemes and in all our surveys, whether it's the National Family Health Survey or Census, we have all the various required splits of data. So, for example, I could tell you very readily how many women uh, account holders are there. I could tell you how many women mudra borrowers are there. I could, if you talk about our micro insurance schemes, the social security schemes, I have the exact disaggregated data for uh, you know gender, etc. Um, so, in most of the schemes that at least uh, we deal with in the Ministry of Finance, we do make it a point to have the disaggregated data. So, it's a bit surprising to me that this issue has it keeps coming up. Um, maybe the financial institutions have not been very forthcoming with that, but I know that all of our banks and insurance companies do actually maintain this data and we also centrally collect all this. So I'd be quite happy to share some of those figures offline uh, separately. But let me come back to the questions that you raised uh, on interest subvention and on credit discipline especially. Um, in terms of interest subvention, I think our findings initially were that collateral is a big problem for women. Uh, of course, low cost fund availability is very important, but if without a collateral, uh, the financial institutions were not even willing to look at women borrowers. It was precisely with this intention that the mudra scheme for loan for small loans up to 10 lakh rupees was launched. And there is absolutely no collateral requirement for up to 10 lakh rupees because this is a government guarantee which is given through a trust called the CGTMSE uh, trust. So up to 10 lakh rupees, there is no requirement of collateral. Under the Stand Up India scheme, we try to graduate the small borrower, uh, women who are small borrowers to slightly larger loans, which is also a problem that I think Minaz was raising or, or one of the earlier speakers. Uh, where the ticket size actually goes up to 1 crore rupees, um, that is 10 million rupees. And there also absolutely no collateral is required and it is government guaranteed loans. So, uh, so the first thing is that one of the biggest stumbling blocks is availability of collateral as far as women borrowers are concerned. And through these programs, we've tried to address that. In terms of the actual cost of funds, no, currently there is no interest subvention which government has made available for women borrowers. But then uh, we've come out with guidelines under co-lending schemes, which apply to both men and women. Now, co-lending, basically we are expecting public sector banks and other banks to tie up with NBFCs and MFIs. And the whole point is to blend the, uh, the cost of funds of the NBFCs, MFIs, which are higher, with the uh, cost of funds of banks, public sector banks, which are lower, in the hope that the weighted average cost of funds, which ultimately the woman borrower gets, or any borrower gets for that matter, would be much lower. Um, and the third point was about credit discipline. In fact, I would say that credit discipline is probably uh, much lesser of a worry as far as women borrowers are concerned. In our experience, and particularly if you look at the self-help groups as collectives, uh, the uh, default ratio is, min is negligible. In fact, it's, uh, women are very, very good repairs of the money that they borrow. Now, in, even if you look at the individual loans that are taken by women as individual entrepreneurs, default ratios that we have are, are, are not at all significant in, and there is nothing which raises a red flag. So I think in terms of credit discipline, financial institutions do not have a worry. But the, the point that was raised about representation of women as far as the staffing and decision making is concerned. In fact, across public sector banks, we like to think we have a good mix of women in the staff. Um, I don't readily have the exact proportion, but there is a very large number of women staff and also leaders, MDs and CEOs of some of these banks. 
Um, we've also got a very vibrant BC model that is the banking correspondent uh, uh, bank sakis. The uh, banking correspondents are the arms of banks which reach out across the country. And we also have something called bank sakis, which are the women BCs which reach out specifically to women entrepreneurs and women account holders. So that's a very vibrant area as well. And yes, we are conscious that increasing the representation of women and having, uh, you know, women appraise, hopefully women appraise the pro proposals that come up would probably also be very, very uh, uh, important as far as lending to the women are concerned. So these points are well noted. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sanjeevji. Um, I think, um, you know, there are uh, two, three uh, pathways which are opening up. Um, so, but I think we would uh, take up the data issue first and uh, then we will move on to the next two questions on, you know, how do we graduate women from the SSG or JLG mode into an individual loan? That is definitely something uh, worth looking at for this panel. Um, and also the whole issue of, you know, women being better clients, better repayers. But when it comes to enterprise financing, so little seem to be flowing to the women. So the better repayers is more for microfinance, um, where automatically women are the chosen clients. But when it comes to the enterprise uh, financing, women seem to lag behind. These two issues we definitely need to talk about. Um, I think the data points, uh, definitely it has been improving as far as the gender disaggregated data is concerned. The point I think which uh, Dr. Smita as well as Menas uh, have been mentioning, Sanjeevji, is about the various cuts of, you know, how do you, um, even women as a whole is not one segment. That is number one. Number two is, you know, we do have outreach data, no doubt about it, for different schemes, insurance, pension, uh, credit, uh, Jandan Yojana, several of these things, we do have the outreach data. But then when we talk to the banks and also the other financial institutions on actual usage of, you know, how women use or how men use these products or what are the customer preferences for certain uh, products and uh, certain features, whether you have um, adequately researched whether uh, you do develop a much more customer orientation, women orientation in developing products and services, there we are not heading uh, much. So these are the points which I think uh, Dr. Smita and uh, Menas were highlighting. And uh, it is very important that unless we have uh, enough data on products and on services, the financial institutions cannot come up with useful products or even marketing strategies. So this was the uh, point which was, uh, you know, uh, being made. But I turn to Menas. You see, India has some fantastic. Uh, technological capabilities. But then still we seem to be uh, lagging behind when it is uh, data capture and uh, data usage. So do you know of uh, any other country because you uh, the bank is uh, looking at uh, several countries and uh, enterprise financing is something very core to the bank's financing. So are you aware of any other country or large program menas where um, such uh, MIS is available? And do you have any suggestions for us? So I think when we, just like when we talk about women entrepreneurs or women enterprises, when we talk about data, it's, a, it's, it's, it's big. So what are we talking about? So first of all, I think there's the data on repayment behavior and credit history and the types of transactions that people do, not only credit transactions, but transactions across the board that actually build their credit history up um, and allow banks to do better underwriting. So I would say that's the first category of data that, that I would think about. 
And then I think the second category of data that is, is also really important is to know your clients and how much the financial institutions actually do know their clients. Do they collect gender desegregated data? Do they analyze it? Do they analyze repayment rates? Do they analyze usage? Are they looking at, you know, there are a whole bunch of potential areas to explore within that data. So I would put that as kind of the second bucket of data. And then the third bucket of data is kind of around public policy and having a more global view of what usage looks like across the country, but maybe not according to financial institutions. And so on that last area, I would completely agree with Sanjeev. You can find a lot of really interesting data here in India from a, kind of a larger global perspective um, and, and really that can tell you a story. And what that story is that's, that's telling us is that we have a problem here that somehow we're not either reaching our market, our target market of women, and again, different sub-markets, or our market is too small, right? It's one of those two, either, either our market exists, but we're not reaching them, or our market's so small that we're reaching as many as we can, but we need to grow the market. I don't think we know the answer in India to which one of those is, is, the, is the problem, but the fact that we can't answer that is telling us something. And to me, that goes back to the other two data issues. What is happening within the institution that we could understand at kind of a micro level? And how can we learn more about those types of clients and, and customers? And, and really also on that third, India has done an amazing job with data aggregation and, and um, going sort of across the board. So, so I, I don't want it to seem as if um, there, there isn't tremendous progress here. Um, but there is still a really large gap. And I know there's a large gap in data because we've looked for the data to try and, and, and understand um, better the solutions and we're not finding as much information as we need. And I think we need to unpack where those gaps exist. Okay, thank you very much, Manas. Very, very clear, very clear. Thank you. Um, now I turn to Greta and also Smita. You see, um, uh, the microfinance women are doing exceptionally well, but when we, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, enterprise financing, the same set of financial institutions see high risks in women-led SMEs, and they, uh, as uh, Greta was pointing out, you know, it could be related to collateral, it could be related to you know, uh, belief in uh, their uh, capability, uh, women's capability in managing their enterprise. Or, uh, you know, uh, so they want the guarantee from men. And uh, now increasingly in Indian uh, context, uh, the first loss default guarantee is a mechanism which is sought after. So why, um, you know, the microfinance gives uh, comfort, whereas enterprise financing is not happening in the similar lines. So what do we need to do as a country? Do we have examples, Greta, from uh, Africa or elsewhere, where you have had a similar mechanism where women were part of VSLAs or the MFI ecosystem, but they could graduate to become individual clients of uh, banks and get uh, larger credit? Thank you. Then I'll turn to Smita. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, if, if I can maybe back up and talk briefly about the data point that Minaz made, because I, I think that's actually really important to answering this question. And, um, I, you know, I think, I guess I think of data in a little bit different way, largely in agreement with Minaz, but, you know, I, I think um, data can be generated in multiple ways and, and you kind of need those multiple points of view to give yourself a complete picture of what's going on, right? So you can create demand side data sets like the Findex or supply side data sets like the annual GSMA industry data. Happily, those generally match um, year on year. And that I think helps you understand a lot better what's going on globally in terms of financial services. So, you know, you can build country level data sets that tell you what's happening in credit markets in a country. And, um, you know, Peru is probably one of the best countries I've seen for doing this. They have the most amazing data set um, on the credit market. Um, 
not sex disaggregated. Um, Chile has been doing sex disaggregated data for 20 years and have really robust data um, on what's going on there. And Mexico's now jumped in and, and sort of imitated that. Um, that's the public data sets. But then I think, you know, this issue of private um, providers using data is really pertinent and it's really relevant for um, the microfinance sector because, hey, guess what? Google knows more about me than my husband does, right? And um, so there are companies out there that, by the way, are putting data or credit into their business models who are heavily data driven. And so if the more traditional microfinance, bank sectors, et cetera, can't get their heads around data, they are going to be left behind. And I think that has really interesting and scary sometimes um, connotations as we've seen sort of in the growth of um, digital consumer credit in East Africa, for example. And so, and you know, looking at embedded finance where there's all kinds of stuff going on. So, you know, I, I think we have to really get our heads around this data issue. Um, but like, I think the question you're asking sort of speaks to this transition between, or from group lending models to um, individual liability credit models, right? And, and uh, there's a lot of history on that one too. So um, there are, without a doubt, institutions that who have made that transition, right? If you take a look at the history of um, microfinance in Latin America, that is the story. They started out with group lending and they now have, you know, individual liability lending models across the, mostly across like the Andean region. Mexico is a little bit of an outlier, but you look at Colombia, Peru, um, Bolivia, these are super sophisticated microfinance models that have really well differentiated levels. Um, in Peru, some of the biggest microfinance institutions are commercial, they're owned by the biggest banks in the country. You still have NGOs working in very rural areas with group lending methodologies. That said, making that transition from group lending to individual lending has been difficult. And that's partly because microfinance institutions are not great at doing data. Um, and, and it's hard to do data when you have a group and then turn it into an individual kind of relationship. And, and I think it's worth thinking in, uh, thinking about this and, and thinking about business models as policymakers look for ways to build those on-ramps from group to individual lending. So microfinance at its heart involves a really delicate balance between keeping the cost of reaching low-income populations as low as you possibly can while retaining good credit risk management and loan servicing practices. And maintaining that balance as you make the transition towards individual liability loans is really important to the health of the institution. And, and it's frankly been a stumbling point for many MFIs. Um, the, the skills, the tools, the structures you need in place for each kind of lending are totally different. And if you've built an institution where your staff are used to working with group methodologies, then it's a big shift. It's a big change management process. You have to train them and you have to build new kinds of structures that enable that shift to individual lending. Loan ticket sizes are larger, so that increases risks. Do you have the data to be able to actually see that risk? And then the cost of servicing those individuals is much higher than for groups. Um, and, and, and ultimately the relationship with the client is fundamentally different, right? And so I, I think there's a whole process that has to take place to move from those group liability loans to the individual liability loans. Um, and I think um, public policy has a really important role to play in this, right? So the regulatory environment, as I was saying before, sort of shapes the whole market. And again, I think Peru is a really good market to look at. They have an amazingly dynamic microfinance market because they have a regulatory framework that enables institutions to progress along multiple stages along the way to a full banking license. So you don't get institutions that are stuck. This is what you do. This is what you will always do. Instead, the institution has a pathway to say, right, okay, I started as an NGO. I want to grow up to be a bank when I when I grow up, right? So if you take the case of Edificar, Edificar was created by CARE in Peru years ago, decades ago. Edificar is now owned by Banco de Credito is the largest bank in the country. Along the way, there were multiple steps they took. They got permissions to do more. They got, you know, a different kind of regulatory license. It, it was a clear, understandable pathway, and they walked that pathway. Um, and, and so I, I think that's a really good practice in terms of helping institutions grow up with their clients, because what they did is they brought their clients with them and they were able to kind of distinguish between who were good credit risks and who weren't, and they could grow with their clients. Whereas I think the risk in India is that you have kind of people who get stuck in ghettos, right? They're stuck in the self-help group ghetto and they can't break out. They're stuck in, in the microfinance ghetto, they can't break out. So, you know, I, I think a little bit more, and, and I think this is a little bit the downside of the sort of heavy government engagement on the 
wholesale funding side, which I actually think is also really interesting and useful for other markets, but it has so many strings attached. A, it's super frictiony to get loans through that, which is why the private sector is not participating and you rely heavily on state-owned banks. Um, but it's a really powerful way of getting affordable um, wholesale funding into the market. Like I said before, African MFIs would give their eye teeth for that kind of access to funding. It's a huge constraint in Africa. And so, you know, I think there's power in that, but I think you have to be cautious that it's not creating these kind of um, siloed ghettos where people get stuck and they can't kind of grow and, and move up. And, and the capable um, on micro entrepreneurs can't kind of break out of that. So I would take a look at that. Yeah, thank you, Greta. Thank you very much for those insights. Uh, Smita, I turn to you, Dr. Smita. Um, you, you have been part of this uh, journey of SSGs as well as this uh, JLG model in India. You have also had a very good experience of working in other countries as well. What are your uh, key suggestions in, uh, you know, how do we address this transition from typically the group lending to individual loans? Yeah, thank you. I think Greta has given a pretty good start to that. And I, I, would, I would agree with everything she said. But I think it's also very important to say that, you know, given in, that in India, there are two models. Uh, we need to have different pathways for the two models. And also one also for the micro entrepreneurs who are not transitioning from the SSG or GLG model, it has to be a third pathway. So there have to be three pathways and SSG bank linkage through the bank linkage model. I think, you know, um, clustering them, making federations. So we haven't worked on this scale thing, right? Every And you know very well, uh, Girija, because you have studied federations in great detail. Federations in India have never really taken off to the scale that they should. And the importance of NGOs or EFAD plus MAVIM kind of programs, you know, the state government with EFAD or World Bank with another state government, these are very important in pushing women through the line otherwise you don't get them you know they get blocked so SG bank linkage needs to see scale up through aggregation because more and more banks will not give only to SGs that is falling what Mr. Kaushik said unfortunately is gone but it's very true that the co-lending model is uh, has a lot of scope and and will develop and will provide a you know sequential pathway but what i do want to say is when it comes to let's say the kind of loans he just spoke about in mudra you see the same uh, glass ceiling problems so you see that the shishu loan which is the smallest less than 50000 is about 66% so two third of the portfolio then you go a bit higher you go to five 50,000 to 500,000 loans, and that's about 25%. And then you go on 500,000 rupees and more, and the percentage drops to 11%. And again, you know, there are two issues. One is that people really don't think women should get higher loans. In a group with group liability, you trust them. But the moment they become individual, then you want collateral and, you know, something that Minhas was so passionately saying, like, why can't they move beyond the mindset of collateral, for heaven's sake, right? So they don't do that. So part is mindset, but part is also regulatory. We have, the Reserve Bank of India has mandated that NBFCs can give only 15% of their loans as individual loans. So even if more can move forward, 15% becomes a constraint. So I know that Reserve Bank of India has put out a consultative paper and I'm sure in the financial submit now, IFI submit, that will be discussed as well. But I think a lot of these things, the Reserve Bank of India is now thinking about relaxing that I, but I'd still not like to end just by saying things are on the positive track. There are big important constraints which need to be broken. And one of them is the government being able to mandate that listen every year 
you know, like you were also saying, and Minhas was also saying earlier, every year there sh we should see a five to ten percent increase in loans going to women entrepreneurs, whatever category doesn't matter. But that kind of policy thrust has to come. Thank you, Smita. Thank yeah. you very much for those, uh, you know, clear uh, uh, direction in which uh, we should be moving. Uh, there is a question from the audience to Greta and Mena. Have you come across any unique models from the other developing countries using the alternative data points like Internet of Things driven models for graduating the early stage women entrepreneurs to high ticket lending? I'm happy to come in on that, but maybe I can just build on something that Smita said that I think is actually really important. I always talk about Peru as kind of best um, in class for regulatory framework. One of the reasons they have that is that there is a constant conversation. First of all, they have a superintendencia that is focused on inclusive finance. They have a banking superintendent, but they also have a superintendent that looks at microfinance. And they constantly talk to industry. So the point Smita was making about the dialogue, and I see that in India too, it's super important because then you can course correct. Payments banks, they didn't work out so well. So, you know, small finance banks win the day, right? And and so I, I think for a smart regulator, you have that conversation with industry and you adjust as you go along. And that really helps to solve a lot of the problems and pain points people are seeing in the sector. On your point about um, alternative data, there are lots of experiments with alternative data. I haven't seen any that have really got to scale because ultimately, the day that really matters is the non-alternative data. And a lot of lenders still have been using that, right? And so I, I think there's um, there there's a lot of data. It's figuring out which data is meaningful. And we're seeing a lot of interesting scored kind of models. I think a better way, you know, I think alternative data could be interesting as a kind of gateway proposition. But at the end of the day, it's about ability to repay and capacity to repay. And so there's so much more power in looking at the data streams that are coming out of the billions of payments that are running over UPI. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, a really important data change that's coming in India, and you guys are at the cutting edge of this along with the European Union, is personal data, right? So data aggregators where people can actually command and control their personal data is going to give much more meaningful data, but also kind of data integrators. So, you know, again, not Facebook data, so much, but like, do you pay your electricity bill? Do you pay your water bill? So being using APIs and kind of being able to integrate data sources, like we're seeing a lot of providers starting to do, is going to be really important to creating that kind of rich environment that tells you, can that person pay or not? Because you're right, Manaz, you know, like the focus on collateral is sort of, you know, 20th century banking. Um, we have so much information to work with now. And just to kind of leave you with one model that I think is a really interesting one, there's a little company called Yoko in South Africa that does basically merchant cash advances, right? So you put a payment terminal in a small business and you then know exactly what they're selling and you then can take your payments off the top when they're doing it, right? And so I think there are a lot of different ways that you can connect payments with credit and have very rich credit decisioning that doesn't rely on who you're friends with on Facebook because the other challenge is, is that so much of the information on Facebook is fake, right? So, um, you know, I think it's a nuanced space, but I think data is fundamental, but I think finding the right kind of data that, that really tells you something about that person is key. Thank you, Greta. Uh, over to you, Minas. Um, so, of course, I actually agree with everything Greta just said, <laughs> as always. Um, but maybe if I could just go back to a, a comment that Smita made, and, and I want to bring in um, the concept of risks. So right now, we're only talking about constraints and how we have to do more to help women access you know, credit and other financial services. Um, and when you start marrying that with data, actually, you create risks. And even with public policy, you create risks. And I'm going to give you two examples, because we need to be very thoughtful and careful when we make recommendations. The first example is I worked in a country, um, not to be named at this point, where there was a mandate um, for the microfinance institutions to lend to only women. And this, of course, was done with the best of intentions. And as we started working with some of these institutions, we realized that actually, even though on paper they were all women and they were 98, 99% women, actually, it wasn't close to that. It wasn't even close to 50. It was like 20%. And the rest were all the men. And what was happening is the men were taking the loans and the women were forced to repay. 
and they were the ones bearing the, the lack of repayment on their credit history, and the men didn't have to do anything. So we need to be very careful, Smita, and I would say this, it, it, especially, you know, lots of unintended consequences in well-meaning public policy. And the second risk I would kind of call everybody's attention to, including me, I always have to remind myself, um, technology and data carries really big uh, risks for consumers. And in another country I worked at, uh, well, this one I think is better known, but you know, in Kenya, the technology and the data got so good that actually you could have small micro entrepreneurs getting a loan in the morning and repaying at the end of the day, all digitally, because of course there everybody's connected. And that sounds good. And actually it was helping them. They were kind of daily traders. The interest rate margins were unbelievable. And if there was even one missed payment, it completely went on the black side of their credit file because there was also no alternative data to, to look at kind of the other things that were actually helping them repay. And so we found that women were going into incredible debt and their credit histories were being ruined. And that was you know, something for the regulator to deal with, but again, unintended consequences of kind of this new frontier we're in. So let's also, you know, just, we should all be cautious um, when, we, when we start Thank thinking you. about the possibilities that there are also downsides to achieving. This. Yeah. Thank you, Manas. I think, uh, yeah, at one point of time, it looked that, you know, 75% of these uh, alternate data-based uh, lending uh, ran into some amount of delinquency and the credit history was showing very badly for these clients in uh, Kenya. Uh, thank you for that uh, uh, warning and also, you know, how uh, we could use uh, data in a much uh, better way. Um, ladies, we are coming to the last question. The time has flown by. I wish we had another uh, half an hour at least, but uh, we come to the last question to all of you. What is your take on top three policy priorities in making adequate financing for women Enterprises are reality. First, Greta. Okay, I'll see if I can do this justice. And a big plus one to Manaz on her point on consumer protection, it's huge. And as we move into embedded finance, I mean, you have a situation where people actually don't even know they're taking a credit to buy something. And so I think we have to be really, really attentive in a data-driven um, credit environment to consumer protection risks. So what are my top three policy priorities? Obviously, I'm gonna say data, data, data. I can't say data too many times. It is and will be the driver of credit decisioning for years to come. And if you don't get on the train as a provider, you'll be left behind. And if you don't get on the train as a government, you actually won't know whether women are being left behind or not um, and whether you can do something about it. So smart investments in data are a no-brainer from my perspective, and I think India is doing a good job on that. Second point is I think regulatory frameworks that are more nimble, less siloed, and allow for step changes in access to services, um, recognizing that customers sit along a spectrum and can graduate from one step to the next. Make it easy for them to do it. So you know, get the institutions sort of in working a more nimble way so that customers can grow with them. If you put the customer at the center of policymaking and delivery, you really can't go too wrong. And then um, I think the last point I would um, say is non-distortionary public sector engagement. And that's where I think the world has lessons to be learned from India. I think there are some things that end up being distortionary to Manaz's point about good intentions going wrong. And I think it's important to be attentive to that. But I think India is getting a lot right on this, right? So um, others have mentioned, and I will jump on the train on this, um, the technology infrastructure that is being built in India is world-class. And I think there's a lot of learning to be done there. And I think a lot of countries really are trying to imitate that. So I think there's a really important piece there on market infrastructure that also can't be emphasized enough. I think that is almost table stakes to play in this, um, in, in the new kind of economy. But I think the other pieces around this wholesale lending and, and directing um, productive resources into low income segments, because basically supporting low income households is really hard and supporting women is even harder. The economics can be really difficult to stack up. And so I do think specialized lenders are important um, because they are fully motivated and focused on that task. Banks just do not have that interest. Um, a bank always has better uses for their balance sheet. Um, that's not to say I think we should have women only MFIs because I actually think Manaz's story is quite a good cautionary tale. I think specialized institutions looking at the low income segment are important. I don't think we should let banks or microfinance institutions or anybody else off the hook in terms of serving women because I, 
women are half the population. They sit in many different segments. And so I, I think it's important to have specialized institutions, but it's important to be thoughtful about what they are. More important is getting that liquidity into the system, which I think India does in a really interesting way. Thank you. Thank you, Greta. Um, Menas? Quick hey, points. Greta, Top three. Can't you, give, can't you put like two speakers between her and I? She always, she always has the great ideas. Um, so I, I don't, you know, three is really a tough number. Um, I'm going to take Greta's idea of specialized institutions and I'm going to say take the specialized institutions and figure out how to scale them. And India has an amazing opportunity with its public sector banks. Um, the regulatory space has just opened up uh, in the past few years for co-origination of loans, for example, and blended finance models, and a lot more could be done that way. And I would also say there are some amazing MBFCs in India's market that are really pushing the frontier that don't have access to market capital, for example, um, that don't have access to you know, lenders of last resorts, um, that are really kind of left hanging uh, in, in the financial sector without um, kind of this, the normal safety nets that a lot of banks have. So, so I would just take hers and tweak it a little bit. Um, the second I would say is, the going back to my pipeline issue, which we didn't get to talk about very much. Um, one interesting thing, it, the pandemic has been really hard on women-owned enterprises, this we know, uh, but it's also caused a lot of changes in entrepreneurial behavior, including within women. Um, and the uptake on digital payments, on digital marketing, on e-commerce that has happened has been phenomenal and way exceeded anything that, you know, we could have, not the World Bank, but even, you know, public policy, anything that the, the ecosystem just took a fundamental leap forward. And I would love to build on that in terms of strengthening their ability to be more productive. And in this case, I'm not necessarily talking about the lower end. I want to spend some more time talking about the small and the medium end. So I would really, you know, put a big push for um, for expanding the pipeline. And then I'm just going to say the word data one more time, and then I'll be quiet. I won't say it again for the rest of the night. Excellent. Excellent, Minas. Smita, over to you, Dr. Smita. Thank you. Thank you, Girija. I think, yeah, data, of course, but that doesn't count because others have already said it. So I'm going to do my three. One is uh, definitely organizations to help grow women's businesses. Because I think from women's point of view, they, they need a lot of support to be able to grow. Uh, we've heard from all the financial institutions that offer non-financial services, that business counseling, helping them to do compliance, helping them even to do simple things like, you know, working capital credit where they have to keep inventory logs and things like that. Women have to learn new skills as they grow. And that's really important. And I think I would go back. I'm, I'm, I may differ slightly from uh, Greta in this or Minhas, but I do feel that the women-oriented or women-focused institutions have done an amazing lot that other people, other institutions have not learned from. And they are still the ones breaking new ground every single time. So I think in India, it's very important to give them prominence to learn from them, to bring public sector or even private sector organizations together to see what they're doing that can actually be learned by the rest. And then I think at the public policy level, definitely monitoring one metric, this one metric of how much finance goes to women's enterprises and across sizes is really important. So even though, and I think Minhas's um, you know, qualification of this is very right, that a lot of money going into women's hands can, does get taken away by men and so on. And this is a problem that in Bangladesh, especially microfinance institutions are just beginning to address and design gender transformative programs. But that apart, still, I think this is really important for public policy to push because it's important to, it's, it's very easy to find out which enterprise is women managed and which is not. So it's still possible to push for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I have received a reminder from Minal to close. Um, thank you very much for a wonderful discussion. And uh, my, uh, I'm not going to sum up. My only uh, one metric which I would like to follow 
is 40% women owned enterprises coming up in the next decade that is a metric which i will root for thank you very much thank you very much access assist for a wonderful uh, discussion uh, around the study report we would like the report to uh, come up uh, very well and then to be disseminated so that we make uh, changes and uh, for more meaningful financial services for the women entrepreneur thank you greta thank you menas thank you dr smita pleasure also thank, thank you yeah. thank you girija thank you very much uh, thank, thank you everyone you very much, thank girija, you for uh, navigating Thanks. us so so finely through this very very important discussion we have all sort of uh, said that yes there is a problem so that's that's a positive note where we start and just taking a cue from what we have learned from our microfinance is like from we need to move from being first users to you know repeat customer kind of language we need to move from customer satisfaction to customer delight i think if the supply side chain start thinking about you know these words probably things would start you know uh, start falling in place as well so thank you greta thank you girija thank you manaj and thank you mr kaushik is not with us and dr smita for this wonderful wonderful discussion and uh, yes we close this discussion we thank the audience as well for participating and there's a i think it let uh, all of us thinking a lot about what need to go ahead for how we need to go about you know so yes and do join us for a very very special uh, address by shri montek singh aluwalia uh, in hall b and uh, we look forward to you know uh, you all joining there and thank you very much again and wishing you all a very pleasant evening thank you very much thank you mina thank you thank you bye thanks everyone thank you